Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. I'm going to be talking about uh, evacuation of high-rise construction sites. Uh, and this project that we undertook uh, is quite a unique project as it uh, is the first project of its type to attempt to collect a complete evidence base describing how workers on high-rise construction sites react and behave during full-scale evacuation. Uh, I want to acknowledge, first of all, the uh, uh, input of my colleagues. There's a number of people involved in this project. Uh, I've listed them here from the University of Greenwich, the Fire Safety Engineering Group. I also want to thank uh, Multiplex for their help uh, uh, during this project. Without them, uh, we couldn't uh, have done uh, this, uh, completed this project. And in particular, I want to thank Mr. Jim Senior, who at the time was the Health and Safety Director for Multiplex Europe. And finally, uh, I really need to thank the Institute of Occupational Health and Safety uh, for funding this work. Without, again, without their input, this would not have been possible. In London alone, there are over 500 high-rise building projects planned over the next few years. And at any one time, you can have hundreds of workers involved on the construction site uh, at any one time. And so there's a high potential for um, a disaster if there's a if something goes wrong on the site uh, and we have to ensure that the workers can rapidly evacuate from uh, from the construction site uh, in the event of of, uh, of an incident occurring on the site we also have thousands of construction site fires are reported each year in the UK so again the potential for uh, a, a, a dangerous uh, situation arising is quite high while construction site fires in the UK have not resulted in a large-scale loss of life in recent years, there is clearly significant potential uh, for this to occur. And so again, we need to ensure that we have our evacuation procedures uh, uh, adequate for the, for the job. And as we can see uh, in some of these, uh, these images, it's not just the UK. We've had high-rise fires in construction sites all around the world. So quite clearly, uh, um, issues of evacuation are quite important for high-rise construction sites. So um, uh, what do we have in terms of guidelines and legislation uh, to uh, protect workers uh, and ensure safe evacuation? Well, unfortunately, um, we have a lot of wishful thinking and, and magic numbers. and uh, We don't have a lot of hard facts and, um, uh, and, and evidence to support uh, a lot of the, the guides that we see in our regulations. And I've just listed here just a few uh, relevant for the UK, just to just to make the point. If we look at uh, the Regulatory Reform Act, uh, the, the, the Regulatory Reform Order 2005, Regulation 15 says that in the absence or, or guidance of uh, in the absence of guidance or instruction, uh, workers are expected to stop work and immediately proceed to a place of safety on the sounding of an alarm. Well, what does um, uh, stop work immediately actually mean and do and how do workers actually behave under these circumstances when the alarm goes off how quickly do workers re react and respond we know from our uh, evacuation experience that people don't react immediately to, a, to an alarm they, there's a delayed response and how how quickly the workers respond uh, so it's um, it's it's just inappropriate to suggest that workers will respond immediately to an alarm the um, HSG 150, the Health and Safety in, Const in, in Construction, uh, this talks about, um, uh, one of the issues it talks about is vertical means of escape. And it suggests that um, adequate, adequate stairways can be constructed from scaffolding. Well, what does adequate mean? And how do we know how um, workers perform on scaffolding stairs? Is there an evidence base um, to support that uh, these types of stairs can be adequate, and if they are adequate, um, what does that actually mean? How, how do workers perform on these sorts of um, uh, uh, temporary stairs? It also says that the speed at which people can escape via ladders is much lower. Well, yes, it's lower, but um, what does that mean? How much slower? And how does that impact safe evacuation at height if you have to use ladders? And my favourite is in um, HSG 168, the fire safety and construction work, uh, and this talks about um, appropriate travel distances and time to reach a place of safety. And it gives a whole array of magic numbers about what are considered to be safe travel distances, well, or, or uh, appropriate travel distances. Well, travel distances is all about time and we need to get people to a place of safety within a, a reasonable amount of time uh, and the time 
is dependent on the travel speed. So how is the travel speed of workers impacted by the type of surface they have to walk on uh, in a construction site? Um, they could be having to walk over decking. Um, they could be able to walk over uh, decking with uh, um, uh, rebar. Uh, how, how do these surfaces impact the walking speed? And until you know that, you can't say what is an adequate distance. Uh, let's uh, look at some of the challenges of evacuation on um, construction sites. And I think uh, construction sites are probably one of the most challenging evacuation scenarios imaginable. Um, uh, uh, wh 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 why is this? Well, for a start, we don't have um, a fire engineered evacuation solution for construction sites. Okay, uh, we typically don't have a, a, an engineered solution. They're, not all, they're also not governed by uh, evacuation regulations, unlike we have for the completed building, where there's a set of um, uh, a regulatory required um, solutions that we have to have in place. Uh, we don't have these for um, construction sites. Uh, and on top of all of that, we have uh, the actual environment itself is extremely challenging. The physical layout is constantly changing uh, and, and, and as the building is being um, constructed and as the building is growing. And this makes uh, wayfinding difficult because evacuation routes are constantly changing. And so we have to be uh, aware of these changes and update uh, the evacuation planning to uh, uh, accommodate changes in uh, internal layout. The floor surfaces can be physically challenging. Um, unlike in a completed building where you're eff effectively walking over a concrete surface, the actual surfaces that you might have um, on, in a construction site uh, may make it difficult to walk on. For example, if you have decking, um, uh, how quickly can work wa workers walk over uh, surfaces that are covered in decking? Um, some of the activities that the workers uh, may be involved with uh, may be, might need to be made safe prior to starting the evacuation. So, for example, if uh, you're hanging glazing, uh, when the alarm goes off, you can't just leave the glazing hanging there. You have to make it safe prior to evacuation. Uh, uh, other issues are, are, are workers uh, working at height. Uh, for example, they could be in, in a cherry picker and they're going to have to get out of the cherry picker prior to starting to evacuate. Noise and construction site is also an issue, making it difficult for workers to hear the alarm or hear voice commands uh, issued by uh, supervisors on the work site. And, and because of the noise, uh, workers also uh, wear air protectors, making it even more difficult to hear the um, uh, sound of, of the alarm. To address these issues, uh, in conjunction with uh, IOSH, a multiplex, we conducted four full-scale unannounced evacuation trials. Um, just before we go into some of the details, it's worth um, uh, identifying some of the key uh, areas on the construction site that uh, we need to consider. Uh, the first part that we want to look at is the formworks. That's the top part of the building. This is where the, uh, the high-rise construction site is actually growing. The formworks usually consists of two or three decks, and the workers move between those de decks typically on ladders. Uh, using ladders. So this space is very constrained uh, and um, it's very difficult to move between the spaces. Um, the other two parts of the building that we will consider, the construction site we're concerned about, is the core of the building. Uh, this is the central area where the store, where the stairs usually are located uh, and, and, and other facilities um, for, for the building. Uh, and again, um, you might not have the stairs completely constructed there and you, will, you may have scaffolding stairs um, built uh, into the structure to enable the walkers, workers to walk between the levels. And the flooring uh, may not be complete. You could have decking and decking with rebar. Uh, and then the third part is the partially completed floors. Uh, and uh, on the partially completed floors, again, you could have a concrete surface uh, or you could have the, um, uh, the decking and decking with rebar again, uh, making it challenging for workers to, 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 to walk over. So, so these are the three key areas that we're going to be considering. The, the formworks, uh, the core, and the partially completed floors. 
And now one of the things we did in the project was uh, after each unannounced evacuation, we, we, we asked the workers to, uh, to complete a questionnaire. And the questionnaire was designed to try and understand some of the behaviours uh, that the workers were um, exhibiting during the evacuation. 27% um, uh, of the participants from the first two trials actually completed the questionnaire, so we had a, a pretty good response from the, the first two trials. Now, from these, 62% uh, of the workers reported that they thought the alarm was a real emergency, and that's quite good because it indicates that they, uh, they were treating the alarm as a real alarm. Uh, and so we can have a little bit of confidence um, that the responses that we see on the video are, are representative of what might happen in a, in a real situation. I just want to talk about two areas in terms of the responses that we had. Uh, first of all, one concerning the, uh, the, the response to the alarm. 82% of the workers claimed that they knew they had to evacuate immediately on hearing the alarm. However, only 49% reported that the first action on hearing the alarm was to start to evacuate. Uh, and uh, not only that, 80% uh, 80, 80 claimed that they were uh, prompted by the alarm to start to evacuate and they did not require a intervention by a supervisor to, to start the evacuation process. However, uh, by studying the video evidence uh, from these uh, um, full-scale evacuations, uh, we see that between 43% and 70% of the staff that we could see actually required a staff intervention to, to get them uh, starting to evacuate. Uh, and this highlights the need for and the importance of having assertive supervisors. Unless you've got these assertive supervisors, it looks like the workers don't disengage from their pre-alarm activities on hearing the alarm. Now, when we, when we ran the trials, we placed something like 30 uh, GoPro cameras strategically throughout uh, the structure. We positioned the cameras uh, after midnight on each site uh, before each trial so that the workers couldn't see us putting, us, putting the cameras up and so they wouldn't be uh, suspicious of, of what was going to happen. Now, from the video data, uh, one of the things we, we measured was how long it took workers to respond. And what I'm going to present, first of all, is the behaviour of workers in the main part of the building. That's on the partially completed floors and in the core of the building. And one of the things we found um, is the uh, response time behaviour of the workers. Now, uh, from, the three, from three trials from two building sites, we, we collected 156 data points in total. And when we plot these, uh, do the analysis of these data points and plot them, uh, we find the typical log normal type response time distribution. The mean time uh, for the uh, evacuate for, for the response was about 1.2 minutes, and the maximum time it took workers to respond was uh, over five minutes, almost six minutes to respond to the alarm. But then we found 32% took longer than a minute to disengage. So once they hear the alarm, they took more than a minute to disengage from what they were doing. And then 23% of them undertook more than four tasks before they started to evacuate. So that means they were, for example, um, packing their tools. They were going around checking things before they decided to start to evacuate. And we think this explains some of the long response times that we've seen um, in the main building. And what I'm showing in this video is uh, the behavior of one of the workers that took a long time to respond. So the alarm, this time clock here, is telling us the time after the alarm. And you can see the worker is just ignoring the alarm completely. He's got his ear protectors on, so he can't hear the alarm. And he's also isolated, so he can't see what other workers are doing. And there isn't a supervisor nearby telling him to, to disengage. At this point, it looked like he was going to start to evacuate, but he continues... Um, uh, his work. He's happily working away and now he stops because his phone goes off and because his phone goes off he takes off his ear protectors and he could hear the alarm and that's when he started to evacuate. Okay so so this highlights the importance uh, of um, a number of factors in this case isolated workers can take longer to respond because they can't see what their colleagues are doing uh, and, and equally if they're wearing ear protectors uh, this can really severely delay uh, the start of the response um, uh, component of the evacuation. It also suggests that there could be some uh, very simple technological solutions. Uh, so, for example, the, each worker should have a, an app 
an alarm app on his phone, uh, which is activated whenever there's an alarm goes off in the building, uh, or they could be issued with uh, vibrating personal alarms, so that when the alarm goes off in the building, uh, the, the, the personal alarm begins to vibrate and, and the worker knows that they have to start to evacuate. Uh, I want to move on to look at the response time of workers in the formworks. Remember, this is the top part of the building where the, the, um, the core of the building is being constructed and the building is growing. What we found on the formworks is that we had two um, types of work going on, what we, t what, what we termed high priority and low priority work. Now, the high priority work is what the work is considered to be time critical. And this is typically just before a concrete pour, for example, where the workers are installing the shutters. It's, it's absolutely essential that they get that work done on time so that they don't delay the concrete pour. Trial 2 and 4 at 22 Bishopsgate uh, were um, what we would call high priority um, the workers who are undertaking high priority tasks. The lower priority task is just after a concrete pour. So, for example, the workers are dismantling the shutters. And so um, that work is not so time critical. And trial one at 100 Bishop's Gate was um, an example of, of that type of activity. So I'm just going to show you here the response time distribution for uh, the uh, high priority uh, 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 work. Uh, that's the curve that you can see here. And one of the things that you see straight away is that unlike every other case we've seen, um, the response time distribution for the formworks, uh, workers in the formworks, is not a log normal curve, but it's a normal distribution. Uh, and so that's quite an important distinction between workers in the formworks uh, and workers in the rest of the building. It's a normal distribution. Um, what we... Um, uh, and, and the normal distribution is different for low priority and high priority work. They are statistically significantly different. The high priority um, uh, activities, we find that the mean evacuation, uh, mean response time is about a minute and the maximum is about 2.2 minutes. So the workers react um, rapidly compared to the main building but significantly slower than in the um, uh, if they're compared to the workers that are involved in low priority tasks. Okay, so we have a distinction between the response time distributions for the formworks and the main building. And in the formworks, we have two types of response time distribution. This is important to understand depending on when the alarm is sounded uh, uh, on your construction site. To, uh, and, and, the, and you can expect the response of the workers to the alarm to be dependent on the type of activity going on, in particular in the um, formworks. Another question we asked is, is the response time dependent on the height of construction? So as you go higher, um, it would be natural to assume that the response time of the workers might decrease uh, because the workers might perceive they're at higher risk the higher they are in, in, in the building. So trial one and trial four we consider to be um, low height uh, uh, construction site trials. And if we look at trial one, we had something like 58% of the workers were below um, level 10 and 100% of the workers were below level 15. In trial four, we had 82% of the workers were located below um, level 7 uh, and, and another 18% um, were located below level 19. So in all, 100% of the workers were below nine, level 19, but 82% were below level 7. In trial 3, what we had was that 56% of the workers were above level 22, and 42% were above uh, level 33. And so we consider the response time distributions from trial 3 to be representative of workers in the main building that are at high height. Now when we do a uh, when we do a statistical analysis to compare the response distribution from trial 1 with trial 3, we find that they are not statistically significantly different. And again, trial 4 to trial 3, if we compare those, they are again not statistically significantly different. But what these results tend to suggest is that up to 39 levels of height, it, the, the height of the building does not appear to impact the response time of the workers. So the workers don't seem to respond any differently if they're at a low height or at a high height. And by high height, I mean up to 39 levels. Now, why, why is this? Um, and we think it's due to the risk perception of the workers. From the questionnaire study, um, we found that the workers 
perceive that they are in a safe environment, irrespective of the height of the building. And because they perceive they're in a safe environment, uh, then uh, that may impact how rapidly they respond to the alarm and, and explains why, um, potentially explains why the response time didn't change with height. The next thing I want to talk about is the impact of temporary, temporary scaffolding stairs and ladders on vertical speeds. Okay, so we, 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 we ran some um, specific trials to measure uh, the performance of workers going down these scaffolding stairs. And so we had two types of stairs. We had a dog leg stair, and this is like a typical building stair. We have a what we call a parallel stair, where the flights are immediately above each other. Now, as you can see, when the flights are immediately above each other, you have uh, limited headroom. Uh, depending on the height of the worker, you have limited head headroom, and this can impact your travel speed. So the question is, given these two types of scaffolding stairs, how do workers perform uh, on, on these uh, types of stairs? So this slide just tries to summarize the difference in the, uh, in the mean speed of, wor of workers going up and down these temporary spare stairs compared to a standard building stair. Okay, so what we find is for the parallel stair, uh, uh, sorry, for the dog leg stair, in descent, workers had 84% um, of the average normal stair speed. So on scaffolding stairs, um, dog leg stairs, workers are walking at 84% of the normal descent speed. The ascent speed was found to be equivalent to a normal stair. So going down, workers are slower. On the parallel stair, uh, the descent speed was 74% of the standard average stair speed, and the ascent speed is 79% of the average stair speed. So the um, parallel stair has a more significant impact on the walking speed of workers on the stair. When we look at ladders, ladders had 52%, uh, worker, workers going down the ladder had uh, a speed 52% of the average stair speed, so it's about half the speed going down and 67% uh, of the speed going up. Uh, the last thing from the experiments I want to talk about is the walking speed over, over the surfaces. Uh, we looked at uh, workers walking over concrete surfaces on decking perpendicular to the ridges and along the ridges. Uh, and uh, we also looked at decking uh, with rebar uh, placed over the top. Uh, and this slide tries to summarize the, the, the findings from the uh, walking speed trials. Now, what we found was that there was a difference between what we call experienced construction site workers and inexperienced. And for the purposes of this study, we defined inexperienced as being those who have spent less than one month on a construction site. Okay, so what we found was that uh, uh, th these numbers here also represent the um, reduction, if you like, in uh, walking speed. In walking across the decking, experienced workers travelled at... Um, 80% uh, of their normal concrete walking speed. Walking on decking with rebar, it was about 78% of the walking speed. And walking on uh, along the decking, um, parallel to the ridges, it was about 73% of the walking speed. So again, there's a significant reduction in the work, walker work, walking speed, and hence it's going to take them longer to travel a given distance uh, than it does compared to concrete. Uh, so now I want to move on to some of the modelling work we did. And uh, one of the first things we did was we tried to validate our building exodus evacuation modelling tool for construction sites. Um, so the first thing we did was we built into the Exodus model the capability to represent these different types of floor surfaces and we imposed the walking speeds uh, that we uh, uh, collected from the uh, specific walking speed experiments and similarly we introduced different types of uh, vertical movement uh, um, uh, between levels. We introduced the uh, scaffolding stairs uh, parallel and dog leg parallel, uh, dog leg uh, scaffolding stairs, and we introduced the ladders. Uh, and again, we reduced the travel speeds for those types of surfaces. Uh, and uh, we attempted to reproduce the um, uh, uh, evacuation of the 22 Bishopsgate case that we collected data from, uh, and we had something like 190 workers located in the main building and 37 in the um, Formworks. Now, this animation shows you the evacuation as predicted by 
exodus of the workers um, on the construction site. And this curve here shows the overall comparison with the uh, predict with the measured curve. So the black curve is the measured curve, and the red curve that you can see here is the average from 100 repeat simulations using the software. Uh, and what we find in, in, in brief is that um, we can predict the clearance of the formworks um, to within 15% of the actual measured time, and we can predict the clearance of the main uh, building uh, within 4% of the um, uh, actual measured time. So quite reasonable uh, predictions of the evacuation time. There are some differences, uh, uh, but that we believe that uh, a, a lot of these differences is due to um, emissions from the data collected. So we didn't know, for example, the exact starting location of each person, uh, and that's going to have an impact on the um, uh, uh, overall uh, level of comparison you can make between the different between the model and the experiment. Okay. But so this gives us confidence that the um, evacuation modeling tool gives a reasonable uh, uh, reconstruction of what happens on construction sites. So then we moved to looking at how we can use the um, evacuation modeling tool to explore issues on high-rise construction sites. And uh, we put together um, uh, two what we call benchmark models, and they represented 100, 100 bishops gate. Um, in, in, in one um, benchmark model one, uh, we had 23 levels, and in benchmark model two, we had 43 levels because we wanted to see the impact of height uh, on the overall um, evacuation performance um, of the various measures that we're introducing. So this is um, uh, one of the trials we did. We, we wanted to see what would happen if we could reduce the response time of workers by 50%. So if we reduce the workers' response time by 50%, would that have a significant impact on how long it would take to evacuate the building? Uh, this curve here that you see, the main curve, the black and the red dot curve, this is uh, the evacuation time uh, for the entire building. This blue curve and green curve down here is the time to clear the formworks. So they get the workers out of the formworks and into the main part of the building. Okay, and again, the solid line represents the base case and the dotted line represents the um, case with 50% reduction in response time. Now, the first thing we notice is that there's only a very marginal improvement in the overall evacuation time. So even if we could reduce the response time by 50%, uh, we're only reducing the uh, overall building evacuation time by uh, only about 1%. And that seemed a bit odd, uh, especially given the way these curves are behaving. Uh, one of the things we noticed, however, is that if you just consider the main building population, we can reduce their response, their overall evacuation time, by about 33% uh, by reducing the response time of all the workers by 50%. And the reason that the overall uh, evacuation time isn't improving is what we see here. Overall, uh, the, the, the total evacuation time for the building is being driven by the time it takes to get the workers out of the formworks into the main part of the building. And as we can see here, there's neg negligible improvement in the evacuation time of the formworks by reducing the evacuation time, the response time, by 50%. Okay, so why is that? And uh, we had a closer look at what's going on in the formworks. And what we found in the formworks is that there is significant congestion around the only means of evacuation from the formworks, which was a single ladder from the upper deck of the formworks into the uh, main part of the building. The workers had to go from the different levels of the, of the formwork. They had to go up to the upper deck to reach the exit ladder point and then descend uh, via the ladder. And simply by reducing the response time, um, you just mean that they, um, they, they get to that congestion area sooner, but they still are caught in that congestion. Um, so what we suggested and what we examined using modeling was, what if we changed that ladder into a dog leg uh, scaffold stairs? So we replaced that single ladder with a single scaffold dog leg stair. And then what we found is that um, if we did that, that uh, we now have a 9% reduction in the overall evacuation time. It goes from 10 minutes, 13 seconds to 9 minutes, 21 seconds. And there's a 17% improvement in the time it takes to clear 
the uh, form works. It goes from 6 minutes 27 to 5 minutes 20 seconds. So uh, we've significantly improved the overall evacuation time simply by replacing that ladder with a scaffold stairs. However, there is still congestion, and there's congestion because there's only one means of escape uh, from there. So to improve this even further, uh, we would add a second um, stair, scaffold stair, to the formworks. The last thing we looked at was uh, the potential use of hoists for general evacuation. Could we use the building hoists to improve the evacuation time of the high-rise construction site? And so here we're looking at uh, two possible um, uh, configurations of hoists. Uh, f we're looking at um, building model uh, base, uh, benchmark case one and benchmark case two, so the two different heights of construction site, and we're looking at two different types of hoists, a so-called fast hoist traveling at 1.5 meters per second and a slow hoist traveling at 0.7 meters per second. We're also looking at two uh, hoist capacities, one hoist uh, capacity having a capacity of 40 people and the other having a capacity of 30 people. Uh, now, in this study, we're only looking at one dispatch strategy. So we're not suggesting that this is an optimal dispatch strategy. There are lots of ways you could send the, uh, the hoist to different levels and try and optimize the evacuation performance. Here, we're just simply looking at one strategy, one dispatch scenario. And um, in this case, we're sending two hoists to clear the formworks, and the other six hoists of the eight that are available are clearing the main part of the, of the building. Okay, and we look at two strategies, one in which every single worker will use a hoist to evacuate, and in another case where we have 50% of the workers using the hoists and 50% of the workers using the stairs. And so this slide tries to summarise the findings from all of those different permutations. Um, the, the data in this table explains all that. I haven't got time to go through all of this. I just want to highlight that for fast hoists with a high capacity, you get significant benefits regardless of the height, and even partial use of hoists is advantageous. So, for example, for the fast hoists with high capacity, um, for 23 levels, it takes 615 seconds to evacuate the building if you're only using stairs, and 852 seconds if you're, uh, if, if you're at 43 levels of height. If you only use the hoist, so 100% of the workers use the hoist, you can decrease the evacuation time by 25% uh, for the low building, and 43, uh, sorry, 30% uh, for the high uh, building. Even if only half your workers use the hoist and the other half use the stairs, you still uh, improve the evacuation time by 23% and 19%. So the advantage begins to lessen off the more workers that use the stairs compared to the um, hoist, the higher up you go. But this is telling us that hoists for uh, if you've got fast hoists with high capacity, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very good uh, tool that you could use to uh, reduce the time it takes to evacuate your high-rise construction site. I just want to briefly say that if you have slow hoists with high capacity, there's marginal benefit uh, in using these, uh, and it's um, particularly beneficial for the low-rise uh, low buildings. So if you have ho hoist only, you reduce uh, the evacuation time by 4%. Um, with the slow capacity, sorry, the slow hoist with high capacity, but you actually increase the evacuation time by 26% if you go to the high building. And if you have slow hoist with low capacity, you might as well just forget about using those for evacuation. So the point is don't use these for evacuations. Um, and, and here we can see why, um, that uh, if you have slow hoist with low capacity, you're basically increasing the evacuation time by 37% for the low rise construction site, and you're, de and you're increasing the evacuation time by 80% if you have a high um, construction site. So hoists only, very bad news, don't use these slow, low-capacity hoists. Um, if you've got 50% um, of the workers using hoists and 50% of the workers using stairs, then you get a marginal benefit uh, for a low-rise. Uh, it decreases the evacuation time by only 8%. Uh, but if you have a higher building, it, de it increases the evacuation time by 16%. So the using, use of hoists is very much dependent on the speed of the hoist and the capacity of the hoist. And obviously the dis 
patch um, strategy that you're using. But this shows you can use the evacuation modeling tool to explore the potential uh, benefits or disbenefits of using hoist for evacuation. Okay, so to conclude my presentation, it's hoped that these findings will advance the safety of construction workers by addressing the limitations, assumptions and emissions in guidelines and regulations uh, through the incorporation of an evidence base, uh, informing uh, worker training and formulation of best practice. You can use this data to improve your training and, and identify best practice. And you, um, hopefully, by encouraging the application of suitably validated evacuation models to define and refine your enhanced evacuation procedures. In this way, we hope that um, the, uh, the work environment for construction workers will be improved through a better preparation for and management of on-site emergency evacuation. So how can the industry benefit from uh, the evidence base and the validated modeling tools that FZIC have produced. Well, for a start, hopefully um, more realistic assumptions uh, can be imposed on the, uh, on the updated version of HSG168. Safety managers can make use of evidence-based planning for emergency response and hopefully um, using this sort of information to um, uh, better target evacuation training and identifying specific issues that need to be highlighted in evacuation training. Uh, I've given a, a, a lot of information in this uh, presentation, but if you, you can go to these links and you can find um, the full report where all of this is documented on the IOSH website. Uh, you can see some videos of the simulations that we've produced on our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can also see some videos explaining the work that we've done in this project. Um, you can get an overview of the project from the FSEG web pages, uh, and you can find the uh, validation data set that we've put together for evacuation modeling for high rise construction sites on the FSEG um, um, web page as well. Uh, and the very last thing is I'd like to thank the SFPE UK chapter for awarding us the best research project for 2019 for the work we did on the uh, high-rise construction site uh, evacuation project. Uh, so thanks to the SFPE for that award. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions.